Welcome to the Expert Network Team Podcast. Where our goal is to inform and educate listeners on matters of finance, legal, insurance, and other interests that are of personal and business nature. We hope you enjoy the information contained in today's podcast and find it useful. We'd like to introduce your expert network team of professionals. I'm Carl Frank, owner and financial planner at a and Wealth Management. I work with clients to help them grow and protect their investments and choose how they want to be taxed. I'm Jeff Cromendite, a managing principal of One Digital Insurance. I work with individuals and businesses to help them understand their risk exposure and lead them to risk transfer solutions that best fit their needs. I'm Nathan Merrill, founder and attorney at Goodspeed Merrill, providing advanced tax strategy and private client legal services to affluent families and entrepreneurs. Together, our independent team combines our expertise to provide you insights and solutions, some straightforward, some profound, addressing real life opportunities we see on a daily basis. If you'd like to learn more or desire to meet with any of the expert network team professionals in person, you can contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's I-N-F-O at expertnetworkteam.com. We encourage you to take advantage of a free consultation with any of our professionals. Just mention this podcast when you schedule your appointment. Without further delay, please enjoy today's podcast. Welcome to today's podcast. I'm Carl Frank with A&I Wealth Management and With me today, I've got Nate Merrill with Goodspeed and Merrill. How are you, Nate? I am doing wonderfully. Thank you. I am so excited about our series about legacy. This is, I think, the the energy that you and I have for this. And and Jeff, if he weren't on vacation, golly gee, you know, he feels the energy as well. It's just great to to see you today, my friend. And and this topic today, you know, I we titled this podcast Wealth is a disruptor. And and my hope is that that's just going to get some people really curious about what we mean by that. And and Nate, maybe you want to take the first stab at, at giving us a definition. We, we've done a good job, I think, in the past of, of talking about complicated things by looking at first principles. And one of the ways to do that is just to say, what what is a disruptor? What are we okay. talking about? Yeah, and I, and and I like to use the example. I'll borrow from one of the authors to whom we've referred a couple of times, James Hughes, and some of his uh, colleagues wrote a book called "The Cycle of the Gift," and I highly recommend this for people who have wealth to uh, either leave a, a significant legacy behind or would like to consider lifetime gifting. And they use the analogy of a meteor that when you make a substantial gift, it is like a meteor coming into that person's life or that situation um, because it's kind of completely out of the blue. You know, we all, we all go about our daily lives with our plan and our expectations. And then someone comes along and dumps a bucket of money on you in a gratuitous sense, you know, out of love and affection and all that. And it's not something you expected to get. So it disrupts. And, it and, sure and does. so I don't want to suggest that a disruptor is necessarily always a bad thing, but we need to understand that it is a disruptor as we fashion our gifts, whether it be to charities or to individuals. And that's what I think we want to talk about is how in the world can my generosity disrupt someone negatively? Like how can my giving someone a gift be a negative impact on their lives and how, if it is possible, how can I ensure that my gift is a disruptor in the positive sense and that it has a a opportunistic in, you know enhancer as opposed to a a destructive um, component to it? You know, we in prior podcasts, we've talked about how when um, you give money out of alignment with your values and in out of alignment with your relationships and your goals and, and the things that you've worked so hard for your life to accomplish when it's out of alignment, it can sometimes come back and be a catastrophic mistake and you can feel regret. And and even after um, you're gone, it can leave a legacy that's, that's spoiled, you know, and and it can, it can really just ruin uh, so much of what you've, you've put together. You can imagine last time we talked about a, you know, a, a deadbeat son of one of the founding fathers, John Adams, and, and what a, what a situation he was in to, to inherit, 
the wealth that he had. And, and, and on the other hand, you can imagine that, that a kid who um, maybe had a bad relationship, but just a tough relationship with their parents and, and was disowned from it, right? That would be the, you know, the, the Shakespearean play King Lear, where, you know, Cordelia was, was disowned by her father, but she was probably the, of the three, the most likely to be the best inheritor of of the throne and so there's uh, you know in in and of course secession the the hbo show is is loosely based on <laughs> on the king lear um legacy and so you've got a lot of examples out there of how money can be disruptive it can be a a, a horrible force but imagine for a second that it, that you're that you are that inheritor like what would you want to receive can sometimes uh, be a, a wonderful way that that the wealthy person can give. For example, if I'm if I'm about to receive something from you know, and I think both of our fathers are dead, um, but if I were about to receive some large amount of money from my from my father before he passed away, it would be so much more valuable to me today than say a million dollars. To get a million dollars out of the blue is not a chump change. I think right. I, you plug in any number that's meaningful, hundred million. If that's not a meaningful number to you. Uh, I would much prefer to have the relationship, to have the story, to be able to ask the questions that that I didn't get a chance to ask while he was alive, and and to have his guidance on certain things would be really valuable to us. And and so there are ways I think that we can change this conversation to just make it better. To say, oh, if my kid were to inherit this amount of money, whatever it is, from me, what what would they be asking of me? What would they really want to know? Yeah, um, uh, th there's a lot there. And, and and perhaps if I can reframe the question or the, the vantage point of this, rather from the inheritor side is, is talking about um, the benefactor again, because we're trying to be responsible benefactors here and, and, and not be disruptive in an, in a negative sense. We, so the, the classic answer to the question of to folks this is on your end of the planning spectrum and mine is when you talk to a client or an individual and you say you know how do you want to leave this wealth behind or why are you accumulating all this wealth what why are you um what's your intention is they want to make sure their family is taken care of they want to do well i mean it, i i don't question people's honest sincere desire to leave their family in a better position and so you you then ask yourself, well, um, when I leave this wealth behind, how how am I assured that it is not, you know, if I say I want my kid to grow up to be a hard worker and um, pursue his talents and abilities, and yet I dump a life changing amount of wealth on him when I die, what is my confidence level that that doesn't take him away from doing those things or her as a daughter would have you know i mean how what are we doing how are we structuring our planning to ensure that a large inheritance doesn't disrupt them from their path of pursuing personal development achievement um and all that sort of stuff because as we've talked about in previous podcasts the money doesn't transmit anything it is a medium of exchange only. It is. And that's a great, so there's a practical piece of advice, right? So if I'm the, if I'm the benefactor, then I can, uh, I can handicap my inheritors. I can handicap the odds and, and put a confidence level on, uh, as you use the phrase to, to figure out what are they, you know, how confident am I that they're going to be successful? And, and it might be that it's worth my time and effort to put a little bit more elbow grease into helping those that are that I feel less confident in. And some of those questions that I'm going to be asking of them and, and some of the lessons I want to teach them, um, I might not be skilled enough to give, right? I, I might not be the exact right person because as you, you know, raising children as you have and your kids are successful and, and, and you know, by golly, my kids are becoming successful too. In spite of my best efforts to ruin them, um, they're turning out to be pretty good. I'm really proud of Papa. But, you know, when you say things, they, you, the kids don't often hear them from their dad, but the, the friend next door or the parent or the other guide in their life who says the exact same words, all of a sudden the words are golden. And so sometimes it's not just um, taking ourselves out of our own best intentions, but we can be the biggest obstacle to accomplishing them. It's good to have a guide. It's good to have somebody you can talk to about that. Right. 
And along those lines, I would say if we're blessed to be um, parents for a good long time, uh, I would argue that one of the best goals in that relationship is to elevate or have your children elevate up to a almost peer relationship as opposed to you know, the parent child or kind of subservient relationship where the child adheres to the parental counsel and advice doesn't mean they can't seek it. But it's at some point in time, we want to view our, I, I personally, this is me, doctrine of Nate, want to view my children as equals, as opposed to, um, you know, where we start off when they can't even stand up or sit up or whatever. I mean, you you are everything to them at that point in time. By the time I leave this earth, I hope to view them as my my co's, uh, co-equals. Wouldn't that be amazing? Absolutely. And, you know, a, a, upon occasion, I think our kids are achieving that I, I, as they get older and they do miraculous things. And and sometimes you sit back and marvel and say, wow, I see your mother in you. I see some something I did or, or my father or my mother or whomever in my life, maybe one of their grandparents or you know, uncles or something. And you say, wow, they really did well. Yeah, I love that idea of having a peer, you know, of getting them to that level. And, and certainly there are ways we can um, help them financially as they get older to learn a little bit of responsibility with, with the type of um, uh, challenges that they're going to face once they have that. And we're not here to guide them. You know, we want to give them just like uh, driving a car. You want to get a driver's license after you've done your training license, after you've had your guidance from an right. instructor. And sometimes that instructor better not be dad because, it, you know, you can get a lot of emotions involved. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so again, I mean, that's, I'm trying to think of how to tie this disruptor thing into that because I think it can be, is if you simply gave your child the car without mm -hmm. the training, without the recognition that they they needed to be ready for it, it could be a very destructive asset, even though you gave it to them with the best intentions. I think that's an excellent kind of tangible example of what we mean by, by transmitting wealth or being a, a responsible benefactor is that we don't send these resources into their lives without guardrails, without preparation, without readiness, because otherwise it will potentially starve or deprive them of becoming the person that can drive the car. Yeah, so important. And there's so much to that, right? It's so much more complex than driving a car to inherit a large amount of money. It's so much more important to um, the benefactor as well as the inheritor. You, you, I, you've seen it. I know I've seen it. Um, you, 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 regardless of the age of the inheritor, the inheritor could be very uh, long in life with very few, year, four, few years ahead of them and still not be prepared for that money. Or that inheritor could be very young in life and, and, and never having had any experience with money, still not be prepared. There's, there's a unique path that every person goes through on the relationship with money and, and having people to talk to about that and feeling that out in a safe way is really important. Um, there are big financial mistakes that can be made as well as just big personal life things. It, you know, money's a great exaggerator for good and for bad. Right. Yep. It's that's why I call it the disruptor because it will just amplify whatever aptitude of the recipient is. And, and again, I like to think that everyone is capable and everyone is, is uh, um, able to be a responsible recipient as well as a responsible benefactor. It's just an awareness that these are the challenges we face. I, I don't know where we're at in terms of wrapping up, but you, you elevated something else too, I think that needs to be discussed. And that is the, I think you start out with this is assets that can be not just financial assets, but property that can be received, the sentimental stuff that we often look at. And um, I know in my life, I've inherited some things, particularly from my maternal grandfather, which I hold dear. I would never dispose of those assets because of the sentimental power and story that is embedded in those for me, that that every time I you know, their cufflinks in the, in one instance and a desk I, I use in the other that I can't help but reflect on my relationship with that individual. Right. So Still I was powerful. With, 
was with a, a client the other day who has some historical assets that have been passed down, down potentially now into the fourth generation is what we're talking about. And the question is how to deal with those assets fairly. They can't be divided in enough parts to make sure that, you know, without, it, it's kind of, it's a collection of books. And so without breaking up the collection and saying, well, this child gets these two and these child gets these two and these child. I, and, and I asked the question, well, why, you know, what, why would you want to break up the collection? It's more valuable as a collection. Well, I want everybody, I want to be fair. I'm like, well, how do you know that one of those children doesn't take those very sentimental, very historical family assets and sell them on eBay? Like, is that an outcome that you want to make possible? Or rather, um, how do you keep, how do you ensure that these assets maintain their significance to the family, but yet make them available? And this is where things like trusts and, yeah. and other perpetuating vehicles come into play, you know, in the, in the make case it practical. Of, yeah. And, and, uh, because I can imagine, I can imagine the kids of those kids try, what are you going to do with a book? Now you've got three kids that are going to inherit one book. Or are they going to divide it into thirds? Right. <laughs> At some point, it's ridiculous. Yes. Yes. The trust, the making it practical to, to perpetuate what's important. And these are, these are challenges that everyone may not face, but these are, when we start to move from the monetary assets into the tangible, you begin to recognize that these legacies have meaning beyond just wealth transfer or asset transfer that, that um, breaking up a book collection has a broader impact, not only on the collection, but the family because of the way you're handling that, dis that dissipation. I have so many examples and stories there in our own family. Um, uh, uh, these close family members, we love them, right? They bought a historic ranch in um, in this beautiful state, and it's you know more than a hundred years old. And and the seller of the ranch had had it in his family for a very long time and couldn't maintain it anymore. So that seller was dealing with the regret of letting it leave the family, but it was not something that they could do anymore. And the only thing the seller said was, look, in here, you're going to find some artifacts in all these piles of junk. And, and all I'm asking of you is you let me see them before you dispose of them. And I know somewhere in here is a hidden safe that we've never found that was been legend in my family. Okay, so cut to the chase, my family finds the the safe and they open it up and, and the seller, the only thing he wanted was any sort of a family diary or anything in there. He said, there could be lots of gold bricks in there. We don't know. I mean, you know, and, and so imagine that situation, right? You're the, you're, you're, you're either the inheritor or the buyer of this case of something that you know has history and value and importance to them, but the sellers, only, it's not the financial that's important to the seller. Now, many generations from the creator of that wealth, it's the story that they could go back and try to figure out how did my family homestead here? How did how did, was this originally created? Wow, what a powerful, yeah. powerful situation, right? If you if you can think four generations ahead to what would be looking back at, it's not going to be even you know a potential fortune in the hidden safe. It's going to be the diary that might have been in there. Yeah, I'm going to close this out with a very true anecdotal story that I became aware of recently. I was visiting for family vacation, Williamsburg, Virginia, one of my favorite places on the planet. And we were touring the house of Peyton Randolph, who was the, you know, at the time during colonial period, he was the uh, speaker of the house for the uh, Virginia Commonwealth or colony. Um, but one of the wealthiest men in town. And they don't know much of the story of how his life transpired. There was no written record, no diaries, none of that stuff. So th this is a bit of a charge to our listeners to consider exactly what you're saying is what could potentially be a most value to future generations is that story, is that history, because all they have to reconstruct the daily life of this great man in our in our founding is the records that were compiled upon his death tallying up the inventory of his estate that's how they that's all they've had to work with to reconstruct 
who was who within the household, what they did. Um, they didn't have any children. So they, they, they housed a lot of nieces and nephews. And these are people that had tremendous impact in the future of Virginia and the country, but they have no history for why didn't they have children? We don't really even know. Um, lost legacy. Right. There you go. That's the impact. That's the impact. There's so much more value there than, than just a little bit of the financial money. Right. That's huge. That's huge for the history of our country, huge for the families. And, and that's what we want to perpetuate. And, and I think we've got some great uh, guests coming up soon that have ways to systematize that, make it easy for any successful person to uh, accomplish that. But hopefully today's podcast gave everybody a few thoughts to ponder and, and gave you a little bit of energy to take action on that and to think about from uh, not just the benefactor's perspective, but the inheritor's perspective, that, that you can handicap their chances of success and think about them as a unique person and what will give them the best chance to achieve the person they most want to become. And help them and how you can help them become that person. And what, what can we do? What can yeah. we do to, to make the biggest impact uh, to perpetuate what's most important to, to all of us? What can we do now, right? Yeah, yeah. All right, my friend, this is a great podcast. Thank you for your wisdom today, Nate. It's always great to talk with you. I, I, I love today's conversation. Well, this is an area where I have a lot of interest and passion and I'm I'm growing in my own understanding. So thanks for coming along with me on the journey. It's been a pleasure. Well, until we see each other again, great, beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the discussion and the information we shared. We hope you enjoy the information contained in today's podcast and find it useful. We hope you will join us again next time as we explore new areas of interest to our listeners or current issues we believe are important to discuss. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe so you are notified when future episodes are released and also share it with a friend that you think would benefit. If you'd like to meet with a member of the Expert Network team, or have a request for a special topic you'd like to have us discuss on the podcast, submit those requests to info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's I-N-F-O at expertnetworkteam.com. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We want to remind you that listening to this podcast does not establish a client professional relationship with any of the professional firms represented, including guests nor does it constitute legal investment accounting or other advice of a fiduciary nature. The views expressed are those of the professionals only. Investment advisor services may be provided through a Wealth Management. Securities may be provided through Genios Wealth Management.